yourself through your servant, through us as we respond. For you alone are worthy. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Greg. Well, I was pretty excited when someone invited me to come and throw my hat in a ring to ref a men's league game in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And the thing I liked the best, because I was a poor student, 25 bucks a game. So I was sitting there wondering how many games could I ref in a month and how could I make this money? And a cautious friend said to me, Al, you know what? That's probably a beer league. I said, what's that? I didn't drink beer. I, what's that? And he said, well, you don't want to be a part of, oh, I didn't even hear the end of it. I was just walked away going, oh, 25 bucks. I could use some money right now. Um, in my foolishness, I ignored anything that he had to say. Well, I got to the arena and they had a ref's room. I didn't know there was such a thing as a ref's room. Some of you think, where you been? I thought, I thought, man, this is kind of like the NHL. Like, I'm pretty important here. But as I looked at the linesman that was working with me, he didn't look that excited. And I thought, I wonder what's going on with him. Like, and so uh, he, he probably thought I was crazy. But really, I might not have been as crazy as he thought. But I was probably a little naive when it came to this situation. So I dropped the puck, here we go, but the first three things I noticed right away as I dropped the puck is there was a lot of foul language going on in the arena. Uh, when I went down to drop the puck, I smelt some alcohol, and then it became very clear once we got playing that uh, the guys were drunk. They weren't skating all that well, and they were really nasty. So... Forget the rules of the game. They didn't care that there was a ref there. And I might have been a little bit, you know, um, I want to show that I'm in charge here. I don't know. But I ca tried a few calls. And right away, the player comes back. He's in my face. He's arguing with me. He's saying, what do you know? And you can't make me go anywhere. And misconduct. He said, I'm not leaving this arena. I'm not leaving this ice. So he goes and sits in the, on, the, on his bench. So I realized we're in big trouble. And soon they got fighting and nattering at each other. And uh, it got really nasty. And there was some yelling and some physical fighting. I looked around and I thought, where's my linesman? He was gone. I don't know when he left, <laughs> but he was gone. And so the game lasted a little longer. And I ended up in the, I went up to my room, the, uh, the ref's room. And here he was. And the security guard was there too. And the security guard said, you better get changed because uh, I've got to escort you to your car. They're after you. <laughs> well, I got a little scared. And I realized one thing, something I always know, that without rules in the game, structure and some, an order in the game, chaos ensues. People get hurt and confusion reigns. It's not worth being in a place like that. So... I was having a conversation with a guy a while back, and he said to me, uh, I don't like organized religion. You heard, you heard people say that? I hear a lot of people say that. And I said, well, do you like it unorganized? <laughs> uh, but I knew exactly what he was getting at. He was really thinking that his faith didn't include any structure and organization or any form. And I get that. He felt that the rules and the order would somehow take away from and push out the spontaneity and the vibrancy and the wonder of God. Now, he's not all wrong. And every church needs to find their balance between freedom and order, or it doesn't work well. Now, it's interesting that the Bible addresses this in a few different places, as God has a lot to say about how he wants his church to function. And I take one of those passages in Acts chapter 14, and it says there, this brings the two together. I'm going to need this. <coughs> it says here in verse 21, they preached the gospel in that city. And they won a large number of disciples. That's vibrancy. Excuse me for a second. Long for a day when there's large numbers of people coming to Christ. There's revival and there's renewal, and we're all a part of bringing them to them to Christ. And they end up in the church. That's vibrancy. I want that. Then it goes on to say, when they return to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. That's godly inspiration that we would remain true to the faith. 
Paul and Barnabas appointed elders. Here's the structure coming. For them in each church and with prayer and fasting, there's an example of the dynamic operation of the two in place. You're structuring prayer and fasting and it's bringing vibrancy to the church. It says that a little later, elders were appointed. I've got to get some water. Sorry, I can take a break. Yeah, I might need that. Okay, here we go. Elders were appointed uh, to help pull these new disciples in Christ together and that they might experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit and grow together as a church. Remember, where there's no structure, no form, and no leadership, there's, there's going to be a lack of focus. Can you imagine what the early church would have been like? Everybody would have had their own idea, doing their own thing, multiple agendas, and fighting if there was no order and structure. We need this. No matter whether you're running a country or a county or a church, uh, this has got to be a part of the structure. It's got to be a part of it. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but my first point is that God is a God of order. The phrase, God is the God of order, is in 1 Corinthians 14, 33. The verse reads, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. Now, the Greek word for peace, if you take it apart, means oneness and gentleness and working together. I don't know if you've read the Bible. One thing you want to to understand, that the Bible is written to churches. We take it as being written to individuals. Yeah, it's written for individuals, but its primary purpose was it was written to churches. God expects us to be together and to work together and and do things to honor him in a structured way, in a communal way. God has brought order in just about everything he does. I don't know if you noticed these things, but the sun came up this morning. That's That's order, that's structure, and that makes me happy. Because I don't like it dark all the time. Um, So God was the one that created the world. In Genesis chapter 1, it says, The earth was without form and void. The darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And then it goes on to say, He put things in place for, to create order and structure, and things work together amazingly. There's a pattern, there's a rhythm, and, and there's all these things that have their place that work together in amazing ways. And so God is a God of order, and I'm glad he is. Look at this, the seasons change, and I'm so glad we kind of spread the summer or the fall into the winter a little bit, but we know that winter's coming, and next week we're going to have a rude awakening. It's going to be here. But God has put all that stuff together. There's order and structure in this world that we live in. More importantly, I think, is that God has put structure into our lives, those who belong to his kingdom. There's vibrancy that he brings into our lives. And I know that without Jesus in my life, I would be a very different person. Without the Holy Spirit ruling in my life, I would not have all the gifts and all the abilities that he gives me. I would stand here as a very different person if you had known me when I was first becoming a Christian. Totally different. God has given me wisdom that's, beyond, that's not of me. He's given me guidance. He's opened doors that need to be opened for me. He's given me a lovely wife. Uh, so many things I believe he's given me. And that's because he's brought order and structure into my life. You've heard me say this many times. Remember, God loves you the way you are, but he loves you too much to keep you that way. He wants you to be just like Jesus. That's a true statement. He'll restore you. He'll bring structure, self-discipline, self-control, and so much more into your life. And if I could dip into my next message in two weeks, Philippians 2.1, it says that uh, if you are a follower of Jesus, he says it's just, it's just natural that you have encouragement coming from that, from the Spirit of God. You have love. You have a closeness with the Holy Spirit, compassion that produces peace and vibrant joy. He's assuming that because we are in a, as followers of Christ, we have these things. 
if you're not experiencing those things, I want to just encourage you to dig deeper into the Spirit of God. He has those things for us. I'm glad for that structure. The third thing, God, we know that God has brings in structure and, and order in is his church, his body. Obviously, it will be marked with a pattern of order and structure because Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus knew that in order for the gathering of people together to be safe, there needed to be some order, some structure, some accountability. There needed to be constituted authority in the church. Without this, people get hurt. The church was never designed to be a place where we come and sit. You've heard that saying, let's have a safety meeting. Nobody moves, nobody gets hurt. Uh -uh, That's not the way the church was designed. The church was never designed for people to slide in and sit. The church was designed for people to receive the Holy Spirit living in them. And from the Holy Spirit, they are given a gift, gift, gifts or plural gifts that the Holy Spirit would ignite within us. And then as we go out and use them, the Holy Spirit would ignite his power in that place. That's the ideal. Many of us come to our ministry with just our best human effort. And I want to tell you, that's just not good enough. So that's the ideal of what God wanted. So that's why we need structure. If everybody sits and does very little, we don't need that. But because we're all moving and growing and we're doing things to please the Spirit, then there's going to need to be some order and structure in those situations. So within the body of Christ, he has brought that order and structure. Remember in scripture when Jesus came to the temple when he was on earth here and he was really disappointed in what was going on there. And sometimes I wonder if Jesus came and he walked down the aisle here and he wanted to say some things to us. I wonder what he would say. What would he think about how we worship, how we do what we do? What would he he say to us? Well, he had a lot to say to the people there because it was full of chaos. People were doing things that didn't please him. And he told them, he kicked over the the tables, it says, and he would kick people out of the building. He did a lot of things because he was just so frustrated with how they were doing church. I want to tell you that one of the things that drives me in the last 40 years in ministry is I want to understand how God wants the church to function. And then I want to try and bring the church to a place where God would say, this is what I want. This is what I love I want to be with you guys because I love what's going on. You realize that the church is eternal. The church I'm talking about is not this building. I'm talking about all of us who are meeting. It's eternal. And everything else is going to get burnt up. You may be saying, oh, man, like I spent 90% of my time this week doing other things. It's all going to get burnt up. It's all going to be gone nothing wrong with that but if we're spending all our time doing that and very little on the things that are eternal that's going to be an issue so I want to get practical I want to talk to you about the order and structure that exists in this church Heartland Alliance Church this foundation of structure and order comes out of God's word and it comes from his spirit who leads us from Jesus who is the head of the church so let's start with the pastors scripture tells us that the job of the pastor is to train God's people to do the work of ministry. You may be saying, oh, I thought the pastors did the ministry, and we just came in and watched. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says our job is to train you to grow and to mature and to get into a ministry that gives you life. Listen to what it says in Ephesians 4, 11, 12. It says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So our job is to help you, to serve you as a pastor so that you can live a life that pleases God and ignites you. Anything other than that, I think it's really quite boring, to be honest with you. I love doing what God has called me to do and feeling his spirit moving within me. So let's talk about the pastors here. Uh, There's an executive team, which is Pastor Greg, which the executive pastor, he was the one that did the announcements, and myself, we lead a team. And we lead a team of 
It's called staff leadership team. Six of us lead the other 25 pastors. And you might be thinking, wow, that's a lot of pastors. Well, it's an important job that we have to do. We want you to experience all that God has within the church. You're going to find out maybe why we have so many pastors here a little later in the service. But the Bible calls us servant leaders. So we need to work together. We need to keep one another accountable. And we need to actually serve under the constituted authority of the Christian Missionary Alliance in Toronto, uh, the president, and then on to Calgary, which is the district superintendent's office. We need to honor them as well and, and follow their constituted authority. And the elders board here at Heartland also is a place where we need to follow their instruction. And again, the pastor's role is to help you, the congregants, find places of ministry. The Bible is clear that followers of Christ are designed to be involved in ministry, meaning they need to acknowledge and actively exercise their spiritual gift so the entire body of Christ will be built up. And so you may be saying, how do I get involved? How do I find out what I could be doing? How do I find out my spiritual gift? Well, I would say, talk to a pastor. We want to hear from you. One of the best calls of the day that we get is someone to call and say, hey, I need to be involved in ministry, and I think my area, my calling, my gift comes into focus in your ministry. Can you help me? And we're going, yeah, that's what we're waiting for, is for people to be involved. So if you want to be involved, find that pastor, call the church, get them on the line, go on our website, talk to guest services, do whatever you need to do, to help us help you get involved in the ministry here at Heartland. That's what pastors do. That's the order and structure God has given us. Let me talk about another part of a structure of our church, and that is small, our small group network. <clears throat> now, our church has two wings. That's what, that's what we would say, the model. Uh, and if it's to fly, if the plane is to fly right, both wings need to be functioning. If the bird is going to fly properly, both wings need to be working. So this is, the one wing is this gathering right here, the weekend service. The other wing is is small group. And so those wings, we need to be working together so we fly right. So if you're not a part of both networks, both places, then you haven't experienced all that Heartland has to give, to offer to you. So these two wings make up the structure of the church. To get to know people, we would strongly encourage you to be involved in both wings. See, if you just come to this service, which a lot of people do, um, but you never never go to a small group gathering or you never become a part of a small group gathering, I want to be honest with you, you're going to have a hard time fitting and meeting people. People will come and go. Um, There are at least five services here on a weekend. New one just started in the last 9.15, was started in the east, and it has a screen, and the service is up there. It's got tables you can sit around, and you can, it's a family gathering. So it's going to be hard for you who may come to one service and realize that the people you sat around last week could be at any of those five services. You may never see them again. It's that possibility. The second thing that happens around here, especially since the pandemic hit, is people actually attend one in six. You can think of your own attendance. Some of you may say, no, 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 that can't be true. But you got to realize some people will attend one every two. When I was growing up, we never missed church. We were there every weekend. And some of you are here every weekend. But then there's others who see church as kind of optional, They may, I've seen some that may be here once a month, once a month, once every six months, which brings a number to an average of one in six. And so think about again, you were in church one Sunday, you saw a person, you made acquainted, he said, that could be a good friend of mine. But then you never see him again because they're in a different service. They come one in six, one in 10, and you never see them again. So it's important that we gather as a small group. We become a part of a small group so that we can build friendships. People come to church, for the most part, to build friendships. 
And this is very difficult when you realize that this is what's going on. Also, the other thing you need to know is there are over 6,100 people who are associated with Heartland this past year. So you got 6,000 people, which works out pretty good. We have about 1,200 on a weekend. This is one in six. And so all those things mean you're going to have to try to put yourself in places where you can meet people. And I think the small group is the best place. So if you want to be a part of a small group, then I would, ca- I would tell you to talk to Pastor Craig, who leads up the small group network. But I coach 12 groups. Other pastors coach as many as 50 groups. There may be another one that coaches 20 groups. There's men's groups, women's groups, mixed groups, children's ministry groups, youth groups. There's so many groups here because that's the way we need to do church. I want you to understand that because so many people that I talk to don't realize that that's what's going on. And they'll say to me, why, why can't I make friends here? This isn't a very friendly church. Well, nobody knows that you're new and we're coming and going at that kind of rate. I want you to know that. Let's look at the third place where structure is really important. The Bible talks about elders and it says that they oversee the church. The Bible talks a lot about elders. 28 times it uses that word, but they also have other words like an overseer. You'll hear that in this text. I want to read you Titus 1, 5 to 9. It says, the reason, this is Paul writing to Timothy, says, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order, put in order, there's that word, that's what we're talking about, what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children behave behave and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must, be, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So this passage tells us who an elder is and how they are to bring order and structure to the church. Let me read you another one. This is Peter. It says in 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that are under your care, watching over them. Not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And then, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So, I want to synthesize some of the principles in here and help you understand what your elders are all about. First of all, an elder is one who watches over the flock as a shepherd. He will be watching what's going on in people's lives, in the church, and he will watch with concern and care and bring correction uh, where that's needed. Secondly, an elder is to serve their volunteers who are in intimately involved with leading the church. So that means they're praying for the church. They're envisioning. They're seeking God for the welfare of the church. Next, they are a protector. They're on guard for the flock, it says in Acts 20, 31. To ensure that what they're being taught is good doctrine and it's good theology. Next, they're an example of a faithful righteousness. They walk the walk. They strive to live godly lives. Titus 1, 8, that I read, told us about that. Titus 1, 9 says that they are an encourager, bent towards encouragement instead of criticism. How many of you know criticism tears down, encouragement builds up? We're all to be encouragers, that's important. But an elder should have this as he's 
used by the Spirit in spades. They're encouragers. Next is they're, they are accountable to God for their role, and they are responsible to pray for the sick. An elder is to anoint with oil, lay hands on those in the body of Christ, and you'll notice every weekend we gather around the cross to pray, an elder is there. Also, when we gather for times of, of congregational uh, fasting and prayer and, and worship, they are there often in those gatherings to pray for people, for the sick. Those are the things that they are called to do. So what motivates these guys to give of their time, volunteer of their time, and be elders within the church? I've got a video. We're going to hear them talk, if we could have it now. Why did I say yes to becoming an elder? My wife Jane and I have been uh, part of the Heartland family here for almost eight years. Uh, when we first came to Heartland, uh, we recognized there were a lot of different ways to serve uh, within the church. Uh, we started uh, in the guest services ministry and right away also joined the Heartland Kids Ministry and have been uh, quite heavily involved in, in those opportunities for service uh, for the last eight years now. Uh, this fall, I was approached by uh, Pastor Al and the nominating committee about uh, letting my name stand as a new elder on the elders board. Uh, I was very flattered and humbled by uh, the offer and the opportunity. Uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time in discussion with uh, my family uh, in prayer uh, about whether this is uh, the Lord opening a new uh, door for me to serve broadly uh, within the church. Uh, I see the elders' role as uh, servants of the whole church, uh, providing direction and some guidance, but uh, being there as servants as well. Uh, I believe that one of my spiritual gifts is is serving, and I look forward to uh, my term on the elders board and, and doing that uh, broadly for the whole church. I decided to uh, accept the nomination of being uh, an elder because I, I think it's important to to serve the Lord and to serve at Heartland. Uh, it's a privilege to do so. Um, I've done that in different capacities over the years from serving on the ushers team to leading small groups to leading Team Del Salvador. And um, not always easy when God uh, asks you to, to serve, but it's always a, a privilege and a, a blessing. And uh, I look forward to seeing what God is going to do in me and through me uh, as, I, uh, as, as I'm obedient to uh, doing what he's asked me to do. The reason I said yes to the elders board is I felt called to uh, be a part to serve, to uh, bless the people of Heartland, to set direction on where we're going, and to kind of be the hands and feet of Jesus at, uh, at the elder level where we can lead and um, really just uh, handle all of God's uh, happenings behind the scenes. I see my role as an elder is to help provide a covering under which this part of God's larger church can thrive. It's to help every person here to succeed in the path that God has for them. Ultimately, it's to use the gifts God has given me, not to serve myself, but to serve you. Sometimes this means breaking trail. Sometimes it means walking alongside with a little sharpening of iron against iron once in a while. Often it means coming underneath to hold someone up or to bring strength. Sometimes it just means laying down to just cushion and take some of the impact out of a fall. Sometimes it means just to be there picking up the pieces. Most of us may have heard the phrase servant leader. It's almost a tacky cliche for our world today. But for me, it's very real. I truly thrive on serving others, putting your needs above my own. I find great joy in using what God has entrusted and given me to help others succeed in life and the unique path that God has for them. I definitely don't do everything perfectly, but hopefully you know God has given me a heart for his church and every one of you. My role is to love God and love every one of you, his church. So uh, why did I agree to become an elder? I believe it's important for every person to serve in the body of Christ, that is the church, in whatever capacity, according to their own gifts and abilities. So when I was approached by the nominating committee to consider serving in that way, I diligently sought the Lord's leading and prayed about it and sought also the advice of some trusted people close to me. 
and ended up saying yes to that. And uh, since then, I really feel that God has uh, directed me to lead with a servant heart, uh, humbly seeking God's will in everything, every decision, every direction we go. And I can, I think, speak for the rest of the board too, that collectively we diligently want God's will for us. And I believe that, that God will bless Heartland in the future as he has uh, blessed and guided us in the past. Okay, let me move to the last point where there needs to be order and structure, and that's you, the congregation. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 13, 17. It says, obey your leaders and submit to their authority because they must keep watch over you as those who give an account. Do this so that their work may be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for them. Or pray for us. And so I looked at that last part of that passage and said that this would be of benefit to you. When we work in the structure that God has provided for us, there's benefits in that. And first of all, I see benefits as the favor of God. And so Psalm 512 says, Surely the Lord, surely Lord, you bless the righteous those who do the right things that God has called us to do. You surround them with your favor as a shield. I want that. I want God's favor in my life. That's a benefit to me. Let's look at another one, the presence of God. Very important for me. Very important for all of us. Ephesians 2, 20, 22, with, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, in him the whole building, that's the church itself is joined together and rises up to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. I want to be that as a church. People have said quite often around here, I feel the presence of God here. I want that. We need that. And that's another benefit that we get from following God the way he's called us. We get his favor and his presence. So I'm going to ask the elders to come, and I want to pray for them, commission them, anoint them for the job that they're going to do. And uh, not all of them are here at every service. Um, we've, got, we've got one who is sick. Uh, that's Brent. That's the first guy that talked, so you can pray for him right now. But I would encourage you, to pray for us as we make important decisions that involve the church. Let's pray together. And if, you, if you're willing and you feel comfortable, raise a hand towards these ones to say, hey, I'm, I'm in it with you guys. I'm praying as well along with you. God, we recognize that this is your church and you desire to lead it. We submit to your lordship and we follow your lead. You have called us to develop leadership, to help people, help congregants, to help us find our gifts and find a place to use them. And I believe you have led us in the selection of these elders through prayer, fasting, and listening. And so, God, would you empower them, help them to build a strong faith in you. God, give them ears tuned to hear you. Give them gifts they need, spiritual wisdom <clears throat> and knowledge. Give them discernment to know truth from error. Give them courage to lead. Let them be encouragers to the body so that we're built up. Let them be known for their love and peace and joy as they submit to you, Holy Spirit. And God, I pray that you would bless their homes, guard their marriages, bless their wives, and help them as they nurture their children. And may we as a church follow their lead. I now commission these elders to the work that you have called them to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, guys. Now, every year we take one of our values. We have five values, and we take one of those values and we put it under the microscope and we emphasize it to help you know that we're structured by our values and our vision. 
And so this year we've taken all five, which is on, which are on the back of the bulletin. You can go on our website and find our five values. They've been rewritten recently. And um, this, the, for, these, for this year, we're going to take all five and we're going to, for two months, highlight them. So for January and February, we are highlighting this, this value. We're becoming like Jesus. We will follow Jesus, pursuing a life of wholeness in body, soul, and spirit, and helping others to do the same. <clears throat> so as we close our service, we like to close it as a time where we commission, where we bless one another. And so I'm going to ask you to stand. If you want to receive this blessing, you don't have to. And hold out your hands to say, I want it all. I want to do it all. I want to be that kind of person here at Heartland. So let me, uh, let me pronounce this blessing upon us as we go. God, as we work through these values, I pray that you would bless us. We need your blessing. We need your presence. We need your favor. We want to walk in those things. So God, I pray this blessing upon all who are here. I pray that we would follow you, Jesus, pursuing a life of wholeness in body, mind, and spirit, and helping others to do the same as we go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming. If you have questions about anything, I'm going to be down here. If you want prayer for anything, join us under the cross. God bless you.